Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Anna Mazze. After receiving her Bachelor's of Science degree, Anna attended a dietetic internship at Mercy Hospital in San Diego. Anna started at Washington Hospital in 1986 as an inpatient dietitian. Currently, she is an outpatient dietitian providing education on diabetes and weight management and conducting community lectures. She is certified in weight management from the American Dietetic Association and has also been a certified diabetes educator for more than 10 years. Well, I'm glad to see you all can make it today. And you can see from our first slide that there is somebody who loves their scale, which is quite opposite for most of us, right? And I bring that up because there's a lot of bad press about weight loss, how many people are not successful. But there's a whole group of people that are successful that we're going to talk about. And I want to talk about them because just like when you need advice or information from, from somebody, you go to an expert. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about people today who are the experts in weight management. Because these people belong to the National Weight Control Registry. Now, the National Weight Control Registry is not a weight loss program. It's, it, was, it's, it is a research project that is, comes out of um, the Brown Medical uh, University in Colorado, and two, two PhDs started the program in 1994. So they're gathering information on people who have lost weight and kept it off and what their strategies have been to keep that weight off. So to be a member of the National Weight Control Registry, you have to be 18 years of age or older. You must have lost at least 30 pounds and kept it off for at least one year. And so these people are sent out questionnaires every year, and the questionnaires are evaluated to see what kinds of behaviors do they engage in that helps them to lose weight and keep it off? And some of the information and some of the guidelines and skills that they have are many of the skills that you've probably heard already, okay? So let's look at one of our experts here. Here's Gary Price. He's been a member since, uh, of the National Weight Control Registry since 2004. Now, he was overweight for most of his life. And then his wife passed away at age uh, when she was only 38 years old, and it devastated him. But he came out of it on top by saying, I'm going to lead a healthier life and move on with my, my life. And so he lost close to 76 pounds by starting to uh, look to see what he's eating and controlling portions, rarely dines out now, prepares most, most of his meals uh, on his own, and exercises at least an hour a day. Okay, And in fact, he met his new wife. Um, through a weight control support group. Our next expert is Ju Sar, who is, has been a member since 2005. And he started to change his lifestyle back in 2003 when he weighed 325 pounds. And he started to collect food records and realized in order to maintain that 325 pounds, he had to be eating 4,000 to 5,000 5, calories a day to maintain that body mass. And so what he started to do was to collect food, again, collecting food records and reducing portions and turned a walking into running and does half marathons now. And so he's maintained his weight loss of 150 pounds. And here we have Sandra Wright, and she's been a member since 2005. Uh, oh, by the way, going back to Drew, he lost his weight very slowly, two pounds a week. Okay, so that's a lot of perseverance when you have a lot of weight to lose. It's about being patient but persevering. So he's a great example of that. Uh, and here's Sandra, and she lost 100 pounds in the first year, and she attributes her weight loss to positive self-talk, which really changed her attitude and outlook on life, which helped to propel her into making changes. 
and she's one, another person who took up running and to help with her weight loss. And during a 13-year period, she started to gain about 30 pounds. She started to gain the 100 pounds back, so she gained 30 pounds. But then in 2003, she put an extra effort in again, started to check her behaviors to see where she needed to make changes again, and she lost her 30 pounds. And therefore, she's been able to maintain 100-pound weight loss for obviously over 13 years. So here is an idea of people who have been successful and are no different than you. Um, in the National Weight Control Registry, about 80% of the, the people who are in the 10,000 people that they're monitoring, are uh, most 80% of them are women. And the average age is 45, and the average weight is 145. Men um, are a lesser percent, they're 20%, and their average age is 49, and their average weight is 190. Uh, so overall, the average weight loss in this group of people is about 66 pounds, but the range is from 30 to 300 pounds some people have lost. And the average years that they've kept it off is 5.5, but some people have been successful from 1 to 66 years. Okay. When you look at the group, about half lost weight on their own, about half also signed up with some program, and which helped them to move into maintaining their lost weight. Okay. And for most of these people, they had a history of having difficulty losing weight, being on and off programs. So it's possible for anybody even after many years of maybe failing on different, um, on different, quote, diets. So let's look at some of their strategies. One of the strategies was to weigh themselves at least weekly, okay? When you weigh yourself weekly, the point is to not uh, demonize the scale or berate yourself, but to use it as a tool to say, okay, what went on this week and how can I do some self-correction right away? If you don't weigh yourself for six months and you get on the scale and you've gained weight, and it's, it's quite a bit of weight, it can be overwhelming, and you might become apathetic about that. So the point is to just keep it in check by weighing once a week. Also, collecting food records is a proven, known tool, effective tool to helping you manage your weight, as we saw with some of those uh, experts in weight management. So when you collect food records, you're able to identify the problem areas. For a lot of people, they don't know where the problem lies, and by collecting food records, you can see patterns in your eating behavior, activity, and other, other ways that, you, that, that sabotage your meal planning or your exercise effort, efforts. Um, so in the food records, you'll be able to see time of day, time, the time of day you might be eating. What's your eating environment? Is it stressful? Do you notice yourself eating more in a stressful environment? Who are the people with you? Some people who, um, who are maybe overweight, who are not really trying to lose weight, may encourage you to eat along with them. Or for some n new moms, for example, when kids start to, when they're growing, a lot of the times they will waste a lot of food. And I've seen some moms eat the food off the kids' plates and then they start to gain weight from that or can't lose the weight they gain from their pregnancies. Okay? Um, activities while you're eating. Are you distracted while you eat that you're not paying attention to the portions, like watching the football game and eating a bag of chips? The food records are not only to help you identify problem areas, but help you also will help you look at strategies that are working for you. Okay, and naturally, one of the main things is to look at the types of foods and the amounts of foods that you're eating at snacks or at meal time. So let's look at some sample food records that somebody wrote up. Okay, this is Sue's food records. So it's a mixture of things in this in these food records as, as we look at them okay so in the morning she has coffee and a couple of creamers as you can see there right there and she has Greek yogurt non-fat Greek yogurt berries that's nice it's a nice meal and she goes to an, uh, a meeting in the morning then after the meeting she hooks up with Mary and they're discussing the meeting but she mentions that it's a heated meeting so she has another cup of coffee and some creamers and Mary's got some cookies at her desk so she starts to snack on those then at lunchtime at 12.30, she doesn't bother leaving her desk. She eats her frozen meal, one of those low-calorie frozen meals, which I think are very helpful for helping people who um, you know, may not have time to prepare a well-balanced kind of lunch or dinner. And if you take one of those, it's all portion controlled for you. But then somebody drops by and has an extra order of fries and gives them to her. So she snacks on those fries along with her frozen meal. Then in the afternoon, she gets another cup of coffee and a couple of creamers. And she brings a banana along. That's nutritious. That was a good choice. But she's still sitting at that desk. Then in the afternoon, um, she, she takes the kids to karate, but she's really hungry by this time. 
And so the kids have some leftovers from their lunch, so she eats the rest of her candy bar, half a peanut butter sandwich. Then by the time she gets home at 6 o'clock, some of the kids run in and leave the carton of juice out. And it reminds her that she's pretty thirsty because she's had nothing to drink with here. Peanut butter really needs something to drink with, you know. So she downs a 12-ounce glass of juice. Then she starts to get a little loose, loose here with not really recognizing portion sizes. How much rice did she eat? What was on the salad? Okay, at dinner time. And then later on at 9 o'clock when she's checking the emails, she gets a container of animal crackers and starts to snack on them with a glass of milk and not saying how big that glass of milk is. So although many of the food items are nutritious, they're lower fat, what's happening is, and, and she may feel like, you know what, I plan my meals, I bring a frozen dinner, I eat, I eat fruits here, I have a salad, I'm eating you know, whole grains, and she might be discouraged by not losing enough weight at the end of the week, but what's her average intake? Is it enough? Has she created a calorie deficit to lose weight? Has, is she taking in less than she needs on the average throughout the week. She may not because these creamers might be adding up, right? All these different creamers, some cookies here, candy bar there. Then, then the portions get, we're not sure about the portion sizes out here. Okay, so she just needs to tighten up some of her efforts and I think that this person would see some weight loss, but she's gotta be, the day, as the day goes on, things get a little looser. Okay, and I think that happens to a lot of people. As the day goes on, it lessens your resolve. So let's look at somebody else's food records, okay? This is Jim. And Jim needs 2,000 calories to lose weight. That's the calories he needs for weight loss, so he needs about 2,500 calories to maintain his weight. So in the morning, he has a nice, well-balanced meal. Whole grain, English muffin, peanut butter. He used to eat like, you know, three or four bowls of Captain Crunch, so this is a big change for him. Uh, and then he has some, you know, 1% low-fat milk. He used to drink whole milk, never eat fruit in the morning. And so he's made a lot of changes here. You now he packs a snack, and, he, and he, when he goes out to eat at the Mexican restaurant with his friends, he's very careful about what he orders. And then he brings some microwave popcorn to work. And then when he gets home, his wife knows the kinds of foods on his meal plan he's supposed to have, lean pork um, and um, more vegetables and fruit at night. So things look good. This is about 2,000 calories for Jim. But then after dinner, he looks in the refrigerator and somebody left a big cinnamon bun from some local bakery. That ends up being about 500 calories. Okay? Then he thinks, well, you know, that must have been a lot of calories. And his friend calls him up and they go to the gym. So he burns about 500 calories there. And it's, that's a lot of exercise for him. If you go to uh, different uh, health clubs, they, on their... Treadmill or bike, if you type in their, your weight, it can give you a, a closer idea about how much you're burning for your weight. So on the machines, it's telling him he's burned about 500 calories. Well, he hasn't seen his friend in a while, so they go out and have a couple of beers. Okay, and then he has just a quarter cup of some beer nuts. And that ends up being the 500 calories back that he ate. So Jim, is taking to the, at, at this point, is taking in as many calories as he needs to maintain his weight. So if this goes on throughout the week, he's gonna see no weight loss at the end of the week. If he does a lot of this and this without any of that, he's gonna gain weight, okay? So that's why it's important to keep track and collect those food records. The second skill that the, registry, the, the registrants in the national, um, in the weight loss uh, research program is following a lower calorie diet, especially lower fat foods. So when we look here at just changing out a few things throughout the week, what kinds of calories you're burning, okay? So going from specialty coffees to just regular coffee and some fat-free creamers, which um, came out maybe about, I don't know, last 10 years, they made these really good fat-free creamers so that people don't use half and half and that type of thing. Uh, so that's a saving of 260 calories. When they go from drinking all their orange juice to having it in the form of a fresh fruit, that's almost 100 calories saved then going from a large bagel and regular cream cheese to a smaller bagel and light cream cheese is quite a bit of a savings in calories, 225. A smaller sandwich, 12 inch to six inch sub sandwich. Going from a bag of potato chips to a small apple, not just going to bake chips, going to an apple because the apple's more nutritious and less calories than the, than the regular chips. A saving of almost 100 calories here. So here we're looking at cutting out fat, 
This is portion here. There's, this is portion and fat we're cutting down on. Over here, this rice is pure portion. We're cutting down on the portion size there. That's a saving of, of 240 calories because rice is fat free. Then over here with the ice cream, moving from again the portion only, changing out the changing out the type of ice cream, going from a premium ice cream that's going to be high fat to a light ice cream. So this person ended up saving or burning, or taking in rather less, uh, 1,500 calories less in the week. That ends up being, uh, in the day, I'm sorry, in the day. That ends up being like three pounds at the end of the week. Okay, because you have to burn 3,500 calories to burn one pound of fat. Okay, so all those little things add up that you can do to make a difference. The other, the other guideline to follow when you're trying to look at calories on a lower fat diet is to please look at the nutrition facts on packaged foods. And the first thing you must look at is the serving size. Even for packages that look the same, like in snack foods, the packages may all look the same, but the serving size might be different and the number of servings in the package. Many items look like they serve one person and they serve maybe three. So you have to look at the calories per serving. So make sure you check the portion size and check the calories. So the portion and then the calories here. I especially noticed that with cereals. The portion size for cereals will vary uh, quite a bit from cereal to cereal. So make sure you're checking. It's important to experiment with modified products, those that are lower fat or even lower sugar, because they might be less calories, but they're not calorie free you still need to look at the portion size that they're defining, uh, that the manufacturer is defining. And for some people that have a problem with portion control, it's, I think it's a great idea that manufacturers have come out with pre-portioned foods. Like for example, when it comes to nuts. Nuts do have a healthy kind of fat in them, but many people overdo it. And just a quarter cup of nuts is 200 calories. And that's easily eaten quickly, okay? So it's better to buy pre-portioned item because at least it's a marker for you if you're going to go open another portion. Ice cream is another one. If you're constantly scooping ice cream out of the container, it gets very gray or fuzzy when you start to scoop ice cream out of the container. So that's why it's probably a better idea to get it pre-portioned. Okay, other guidelines for following a lower calorie or lower fat diet. Some of these you already know. Avoiding fried foods or, and sometimes the description, especially at restaurants, is not clear if it's fried. It might say breaded. It might say crispy. It might say nuggets. That all those descriptions all indicate higher fat or fried. So you want to look at methods of cooking that usually are lower fat, so baking, broiling. And if it's not clear, always ask how something is prepared. Order all your fats on the side at restaurants and be mindful about how much you are using even at home. So use fats, overall fats, sparingly because they're all the same calories. Olive oil, canola oil, butter, they're all about the same calories. Some are, more, are healthier than others. So Use the fats sparingly mod and experiment with lighter kinds of items like light mayonnaise, light sour, sour cream, those kinds of what we call fats. Select lean meats. Try to, in fact, try to eat a vegetarian meal a couple of times a week using beans or lentils. And the American Heart Association recommends at least having two fish meals per week to get the cardioprotective benefits of the fish oils and that, are in, uh, that are only in fish. If you're going to select poultry, make sure that it's consistently white meat and skinless. You can cook with the skin on, but then take it off to kind of retain some of that moisture. And when it comes to beef, pork, and lamb, consistently select lean cuts. Trim the fat off. If you're going to purchase ground turkey, ground chicken, or, or hamburger also, you should buy it into the 90% fat-free uh, type of ground meat. And when it comes to dairy products, it's really important to select non-fat or 1% dairy products. And overall, try to be careful with how much cheese you eat because the calories can really add up from cheese. It's really easy to eat excess cheese because you don't have to do anything to it. it it's it, an easy snack to have. It's on pizza. People sprinkle, sprinkle it on salads. Uh, it's in, you know, on sandwiches and on lasagna and hamburgers. So it's found in a lot of places that you may not, and you may not really think about it. So that's something to evaluate. The other way to cut down on calories is to make half that plate more fruits and vegetables. And that's what the um, US Dietary Guidelines is encouraging with the use of Choose My Plate. It used to be Choose My Pyramid, but now it's Choose My Plate. 
And as you can see, half that plate is fruits and vegetables to help you cut down on higher calorie foods that the other plate might be. So let's look at some of our pictures up here. I think it's easier than ever to get more fruits and vegetables in your diet, especially here living in California. A lot of the vegetables come now, fresh vegetables come cleaned, trimmed, ready to microwave in microwavable bags. They've even improved on the packaging of frozen vegetables so that when you, the new technology is that when you steam them, they're not overly cooked in the microwave. So you have bag salads now. Uh, and when you use meat and chicken, uh, or, or beef and pork especially, a good way to stretch those meats out and to just enjoy the flavor of those without eating too much meat is to use them in a stir, in, in a stir fry or like in fajitas. Uh, adding vegetables to pasta is another way to get more vegetables in the diet or in soups. And many times in the store for, that I see they have big platters for parties of vegetable platters and fruit platters, but I've seen them making them in smaller sizes now so for the individual to take to work or in their lunch bag. So I, I'm noticing that they're coming in smaller portions now at different stores. So think of ways to uh, incorporate the vegetables and fruit in the diet. The other skill to follow are just other behavioral strategies. And one of the behaviors that uh, those in the National Weight Control Registry be, uh, engaged in is to eat breakfast consistently. They found that eating breakfast every day helps to reduce your hunger throughout the day. You're less likely to compensate for not eating in the morning and overeating later on. Also, prolonging the fast from eating the night before and skipping breakfast, what happens is insulin behaves in unpredictable ways and can encourage weight gain. Insulin is one of our hormones that we call a storage hormone. It helps to store nutrients, specifically calorie nutrients like uh, calories from carbohydrate, calories from fat. So you make insulin behave unpredictably when you go, go through a, long, a prolonged fast, and that might encourage weight gain. Also, by eating a healthy meal, it seems to psychologically start people off in the right direction in the day to make, help them make healthier choices throughout the day. And it's been found that not, incre not eating breakfast is associated with decreased activity during the day. So the people who eat breakfast more often also are more active. And going on from that, waiting too long to eat or skipping meals causes you to feel starved at the next meal and then eating too much at that meal, and you might end up leaving very full. And usually when you're very starved, you'll eat quickly. And it takes about 20 minutes for your stomach to tell your head that you are full. Okay, so I'm sure that, think about the experiences that you've had where you waited too long, you overeat and you're eating fast, and then you're uncomfortable after. Now, with all of these things, I'm not, you're gonna, this might happen again to you, but you just don't wanna do it frequently. Uh, when you go shopping, and that's another reason not to go hungry, right? Because you might stop off at every place they're giving samples at and make a, make a meal of that. So it's important to go and make, make a list of the items that you need, because that goes on to the next behavior to engage in, is to be prepared. Have the food items that you need, because you're gonna scavenger around for foods if you're hungry or it's not well planned and you might make the wrong choice. So go shopping with a list of items that you need and don't go hungry because foods are more tempting when they're free and you're hungry. So be prepared, as I mentioned, and purchase all the items that you need for not only meals, but snacks and desserts. Desserts can be worked in. Many times when people go on a diet, they feel so restricted, but many kinds of foods that you enjoy can be worked in. They just have to be planned in. And you can find substitutes for some of those foods that are equally satisfying. Another major pet peeve of mine is having foods in the house that sabotage your efforts. Out of sight, out of mind, and then out of mouth, okay? That's what happened to a, the other slide I showed you where the man saw that, cin that cinnamon bun. He wasn't planning on even going out and getting one, but somebody had left it there. So that triggers you to say, hey, I haven't had one of those in a while. Okay, so also be aware that don't confuse hunger with boredom or depression or stress. Many times people, you know, eat inappropriately for those reasons. So seek counseling if needed and be with people who support your efforts. Okay, people at work, your family, you know, tell them that you're trying to lose weight for better health overall and for them to be, you know, on top of it for them. So, you know, ask people up front to give you support. And of course, the people in, the, in this program uh, exercise every day. We found that exercise is the most important thing for maintaining lost weight. 
And this little picture actually shows you the proper way to walk because that was the number one way people in the, uh, the registrants of the National Weight Control Registry lost weight or exercise was to do the walking. It was the most common type of activity. And not all of them walked 60 to 90 minutes a day at one time. They broke up the activity throughout the day. Now that's quite a bit of activity, but that's what it took to lose the weight and keep it off. The American uh, College of Sports Medicine and the American Heart Association recommend to reduce your risk of chronic diseases or age-related weight gain to engage in this level of activity here. Moderate intense cardio, uh, vascular kind of exercise, aerobic activity, 30 minutes, five days a week. Or vigorous intense cardiovascular activity, 20 minutes, three days a week. That's assuming you've cleared it with your physician. You should not gauge in any kind of activity unless you've told your doctor you're gonna start an exercise plan and maybe he can also talk to you about exercises you, sh you should not engage in depending on your different medical problems, okay? Uh, so to lose weight and maintain that loss, it gets pretty aggressive with the activity. 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity most days and 90 minutes to sustain the loss because you're really changing that metabolism. You're burning not only burning the calories, uh, you're maintaining muscle mass which burns more calories also. Now, when you look at different activities, I, I find that this is the hardest lifestyle change for people to make is, is activity more than changing their diet because it's really time out of the day that people don't have. So with all of these lifestyle changes, identify where your barriers are. In the case of exercise, where are your barriers and what type of exercise could you try that's gonna fit into your lifestyle? So for example, let's say you don't have, quite a, you don't have enough money to really join a gym, um, you don't have room where you live to have e exercise equipment, so the best thing for you to do is maybe do a, you know, a walking plan, get the correct shoes and clothing maybe get an iPod, download books on tape or music to listen to that's gonna encourage you to go walking. So let's take expert advice from the people in the National Weight Control Registry by consuming a lower calorie diet, which includes usually selecting lower fat foods and controlling portions because even foods that are fat free still have calories, so it goes back to portion. And not to skip meals because you're setting yourself up to overeat, especially when you skip breakfast and gradually increase activity as medically allowed. Include flexibility, flexibility training, aerobic exercise, and strength training. All of those would equal a balanced exercise program. And if you can't do all your activity at once, you'll get the same benefit from dividing it up throughout the day. And overall, we just need to sit less and we find ourselves sitting mostly when we are being entertained by the TV and you know, working with the computer, okay, with the technology we have now. Well, I want to thank you for coming today, and I hope some of your uh, questions were answered. And so remember to be, uh, be patient with weight loss, but persevere. And the, one of the most important things is to be consistent with what you do. Okay? And good luck.